Good morning, everyone. Whether you're joining us in person or online, we are so glad to have you with us today. We believe you're here for a reason, and we're excited to worship with you. In the book of Ruth, we see a powerful example of God's faithfulness. As we sing these words together, let's remember the great things God has done in our past and the promise of even greater things to come. Just as he guided Ruth and Naomi, he is guiding each one of us. Let's open our hearts to his presence today and celebrate his greatness with joy and gratitude. Please stand and join us. Come. 
flesh is white as snow I believe that the power of the gospel still makes the broken whole I believe that the curse of sin was broken when they rolled away that stone I believe I believe I believe as I bow before you
you this morning, Lord. Father, for you are the King of Kings, Father, and the Lord of Lords. For you have defeated darkness and conquered death. Father, we pray that as we continue to worship you this morning, Lord, that you open our hearts and our minds to everything you have for us this morning. Jesus, we love you, and we pray this all in your precious name. Amen. Please be seated. Good morning, Woodlands. Ah, it is good to be together. It's good to worship together. It's just always so. There's just something, there's something powerful about it. There's something real about it. I'm really thankful uh, to be here as we continue in, in the book of Ruth as well. Um, this last week, the weather's been great. I had the opportunity to get away with my family for a couple of days down at Lake Geneva with my extended family, and we worked really hard at doing nothing which is awesome, uh, took a little bit of a vacation. Um, there was a, a moment, I thought I'd, I'd share it because it was just so sweet and, and amusing with my youngest daughter. You never know how your kids are gonna be sleeping on vacation. If you have younger kids in particular, it's always kind of a, a toss up. So we're really intentional about trying to help them get to sleep. And so I was laying in bed next to my youngest daughter who's just about five uh, right now, and she was getting drowsy. We read a book, and uh, I kind of snuggled up next to her and put my arm around her and said, Beatrix, would it be okay if I prayed with you uh, before you went to sleep? She said, yeah, Dad. I said, is there anything I can pray about for you? She said, no, Dad. I'm like, okay. Well, Heavenly Father, thank you so much for Beatrix. And, and she, inter- she like, lifts her head and interrupts, and she's like, Dad, could you do that in your head? I'm trying to go to sleep. <laughs> And I was like, yeah, that's easy for me to do. (laughs) That's awesome. Uh, I'm going to happily pray my head and you go to sleep, my darling little angel. Um, So that was a a sweet, sweet time. It was a sweet, sweet couple of days. Um, Just to to catch us up, uh, we're working through the book of Ruth. Now, uh, we're week two, chapter two in Ruth. Last week, we were introduced to this family during the time of the judges. Naomi and Elimelech, who uh, made the hard decision to leave the land of promise, and they went to Moab, where their sons found wives. And over the course of 10 years, tragedy struck this family in the midst of famine. And Elimelech, the husband, died. Two sons died. And as Naomi and Ruth were heading back, the other daughter-in-law, Orpah, also left. And so at the end of chapter 1, we're wrestling with a family that is facing despair, if you remember, we said that despair is tragedy without trust. And uh, as Naomi returned to Bethlehem and her grief poured out, she said, don't call me pleasant, call me bitter, because the Lord has dealt bitterly with me. Um, we just had this picture. It's, it's rightfully sad and heavy uh, and raises a lot of questions. How is God going to continue to work 
into and through this chapter. In chapter two of Ruth, if you have your Bibles, you can turn there. Um, if you use a phone, kind of a digital Bible, I'm in the ESV, we'll have the text on the screen as well. But a physical Bible is really helpful, especially as we're kind of putting different things together to jump around. So I'd encourage you, you can bring a physical Bible to church. Um, chapter two has such a different feel to it, um, especially for early Jewish readers. We're going to try to put ourselves in their shoes and understand what's going on. Um, whereas chapter one is heavy and dark, chapter two is, I kid you not, it is a Hallmark movie script. Um, it is the original Hallmark movie script. One of, the favorite, one of my favorite satirical headlines I've seen in my life was that scientists are coming close to developing a second Hallmark movie plot. Um, been, they've been working at it for decades. Uh, they're getting close. So this is the work that they do. Um, but the first plot, uh, boy meets girl, you know, girl falls in love with boy, all that stuff. That's Ruth 2. That was first introduced here in Ruth 2. Um, and it's super fun. It's going to be super fun to go through it. So let's just start uh, getting that sense from the end of chapter 1, verse 22 of chapter 1. So Naomi returned, and Ruth the Moabite, her daughter-in-law with her, who returned from the country of Moab. And they came to Bethlehem at the beginning of the barley harvest. So this small town about seven miles outside of Jerusalem at the beginning. Remember, that's looking for hope, the barley harvest. Now, Naomi had a relative of her husband's, a worthy man of the clan of Elimelech, whose name was Boaz. Boaz gets introduced here into verse one, and then he's going to kind of situate and talk a little bit about what Ruth and Naomi are doing. But the writer here is telegraphing, there's this guy that we should know about. Let me give you a little bit of context here. Uh, Bethlehem, when you picture Bethlehem, don't picture a big city. Don't picture even a big town. Picture maybe at most like 50 families. That's kind of the size, 50 family homes. And they're probably situated, there's some in the center of town, but many of them are situated on the outside of the town to kind of form some sort of a wall or barrier that made a town a town. There's a town gate that's going to actually factor into the story later. But it's this little gathering of homes, and immediately outside of the homes are the family fields where they, they grow the produce that is going to sustain everybody in the town for the entire year. So these are super, super important fields. The fields are owned by families. They're passed down from generation to generation. We're going to continue talking about that as we go through this, uh, this book because that's an important understanding. But when we think about corn fields or grain fields or potato fields here in Wisconsin, we think about acres and acres as far as the eye can see and lots of machinery doing the work. Don't think about that here. Instead, these fields are hand sown. These fields are hand plowed, maybe by an oxen with plows behind it. These fields are hand watered, they're hand cultivated, they're hand reaped. Everything's done by hand by the families. As soon as children can be out in the fields, they're going to be in the fields helping dad and aunts and uncles take care of the crop. So it's a very family-oriented situation. And part of, we're telegraphed here, Elimelech's family is this man named Boaz. And it says that Boaz was a worthy man there in verse 1. Worthy man, it's a little bit, it's a harder word to translate. Uh, essentially, the actual Hebrew says that he was a man mighty in chiam, which is this, this word that was used, if it's like a, a warrior, it was valor, could be strength, it could be money. Essentially, I'm just going to translate it into 21st century, uh, what this verse is saying is that Boaz is a man mighty in being an eligible bachelor. He is a man mighty in being marriage material. And for whatever reason, we don't know, he's, he was probably a widower as well. Boaz uh, is looking for someone. And so that's kind of like, oh, interesting. We have a widow and a widower, and uh, they're related. That's important here uh, for ancient years. Let's see what happens. Well, what happens is tension. And Ruth the Moabite said to Naomi, uh, let me go to the field and glean among the ears of grain after him in whose sight I shall find favor. And Naomi says to her, go, my daughter. So it's not really clear this is like the next day after they got to Bethlehem, but um, the question for Naomi and Ruth is how are we going to get food? We need food. And Ruth has a solution. Let, let me go and glean. And Naomi, in her despair, in her brokenness, 
You can almost imagine she shrugs her shoulders and says, fine, go. So Ruth set out and went and gleaned in the field after the reapers, and she happened, huh, just so happened, to come to the part of the field belonging to Boaz, who was of the clan of Elimelech. So, so what, what, what's going on here? Ruth and Naomi have a problem. They have a real problem. Because even if they had money, they can't go to the supermarket and buy food. 100% of the food that these people in Bethlehem are consuming has been grown by themselves in their family fields. And Ruth and Naomi come at the harvest, but they have, they have no fields that they've planted in. They have no fields that they've cultivated, that they've cared for, that they've grown. They have no workers to go out and reap in those fields that they don't have planted. And so how will they survive? Well, they'll survive, hopefully. This is, this is Ruth's idea. We're going to survive based on the faithfulness of the people to two little verses in the Old Testament. Leviticus 19 and in Deuteronomy. Leviticus 19, God in giving the law said to the people through Moses, when you reap the harvest of your land, you shall not reap to the edges of the fields, neither shall you gather the gleanings after your harvest. Well, why shouldn't you do that? Moses expounds on it in Deuteronomy 24. Moses in Deuteronomy says, when you reap the harvest of your field and forget a sheaf in the field, you shall not go back to get it. It's for the sojourner, the fatherless, and the widow, that the Lord your God may bless you in all the work of your hands. So this is God instituting a national social security program for this agrarian culture. And that's what this, this looks like. When they would reap, the reapers would go through with a sickle in one hand, and the, the men would gather up all of the grain they could hold in one hand, and with a the sickle they would cut it off, and then they would lay it down on the ground and they would move forward. You can imagine how slow this process was, harvesting the grain. They're cutting it, they're laying it down, they're trying to keep it all together. And behind them, young women from that family would come and they would gather up those bundles and they would tie them up into sheaves of grain that they would then bring over to the threshing floor to be beat out and turned into grain and flour for bread, that process. And God, through Moses, and then Moses expanding on that, is clear that when you're picking up, when you're harvesting this, if you miss a stalk of grain, if you miss some grass, you leave it there. And in fact, you don't even go to the edges of your field because there are those in your community that need that. And they're to be permitted to come behind and glean behind your young women or that, that process. So Ruth's idea is, let's hope someone's allowing this to take place. And Naomi shrugs her shoulders, let's hope. And I love the happenstance language in this, verse 3. It's, it's like, and it just so happened that Ruth ended up in Boaz's field. Well, we know that he's a worthy man, but uh, let's learn more about him. And Boaz came from Bethlehem. And he said to the reapers, the Lord be with you. Like, this is really, this is all of this man's livelihood, right? He's like, let's see how my money's doing. Um, and they answered, the Lord bless you. Our first introduction to Boaz is that he's a man seeking to be faithful to God. And then Boaz said to his young man who was in charge of the reapers, he's like, wait a second. Whose young woman is this? It's kind of like, hey, who that? Like, what's going on here? And the servant who was in charge of the reapers answered, she is the young Moabite woman who came back with Naomi from the country of Moab. So, so immediately Boaz knows who, who this is. We don't know how much he knows about who Ruth is. We're gonna learn that later in the passage, but we know at this point, Boaz knows he's related from the clan of Elimelech to her. She said, verse seven, this is the, the young man in charge of the reapers. She said, Please let me glean and gather among the sheaves after the reapers. So she came and she has continued from early morning until now, except for a short rest. Uh, a word about verse 7 there on the screen. It, it's, it's a little hard to understand, even in the original Hebrew, exactly the request and actions uh, that Ruth is taking. But if this translation is correct, and it, it's a great translation, um, 
what it seems like Ruth was asking was pretty audacious. Because she wasn't just asking, let me glean behind the young women picking up what might be left. Let me glean actually among the sheaves. That's a privilege. That was a right that wasn't even afforded to immediate family necessarily. She wasn't given an answer. She wasn't said yes or no to that audacious request. But instead, she has been working from sun up, which is when the harvest would have started, until now, gleaning behind the women. So Boaz is like, okay, this is a woman who's working hard. And he goes up then, verse 8, and he talks to her. Now listen, my daughter. Do not go to glean in another field or leave this one, but keep close to my young women. Keep your eyes, let your eyes be on the field that they are reaping and go after them. He's like, don't, don't stay far behind them. Be close. Get up in there. Have I not charged the young men not to touch you? You're going to be safe. And when you're thirsty, go to the vessels, drink what the young men have drawn. Like, we're going to care for you. This is generous. This is gracious. This is kind. Ruth is floored. She falls on her face, bowing to the ground, and said to them, what have I, why have I found favor in your eyes that you should take notice of me since I am a foreigner? Remember, Ruth doesn't yet know that she's related to Boaz. She doesn't know that she's family. She's like, why would you take care of me? And Boaz answers profoundly. We learn how much he knows about Ruth. In verse 11, Boaz answered her, all that you have done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband, your faithfulness to Naomi has been fully told to me. How you left your father and mother in your native land and came to a people that you did not know before. May the Lord repay you for what you have done and a full reward be given to you by the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to take refuge. That's just incredible. And then she said, I have found favor in your eyes, my Lord, for you have comforted me and spoken kindly to your servant, though I am not one of your servants. I just love this. I, I don't know how the word would have gotten out. I don't know if Naomi had shared what Ruth said to her on the road from uh, Moab to Bethlehem. It's recorded in chapter one. But, but somehow Boaz had heard the commitment that Ruth had made. She had said when Orpah turned away, when, when Naomi said, Orpah, go back to your gods. They're going to serve you better than the God of Israel. And Ruth planted her feet, and she said, no, Naomi, I will not leave. May your people be my people. May your God be my God. I will live with you. I will die with you. I will be faithful to you. Somehow, that declaration had made its way to Boaz. He was floored by it. He said, God is going to gather you under the shadow of his wings, and he is going to care for you. You can imagine Ruth's excitement. This is going so much better than she could have imagined. It gets better. Verse 14, and at mealtime, Boaz said to her, come here, eat some bread, dip your morsel in the wine. So she sat beside the reapers and he passed to her roasted grain and she ate until she was satisfied. She had some left over. Like this might've been the first time in years that Ruth is full. And she's like getting out her purse and putting in the leftovers. She's like kind of stashing it away for, for later. She's super, super excited. And then... When she rose to glean, Boaz instructed his young men, saying, let her glean even among the sheaves and do not reproach her. You remember that audacious request she made in verse 7? Boaz is like, yeah, I'm going to fulfill that. What's more, also pull out some from the bundles for her and leave it for her to glean. Don't rebuke her. This is just unbelievable. Things are going so well for Ruth right now. So verse 17 so she gleaned in the field until evening. And then she beat out what she had gleaned, and it was about an apha of barley. We don't know exactly how much that was, but let's guess 30 to 50 pounds of finished barley. And she took it up. Like this young woman, you can imagine her walking from the fields with this slung over her shoulder, went into the city. Her mother-in-law, Naomi, saw what she had gleaned. And she also brought out and gave her what food she had left over after being satisfied. Can you imagine? I love, I love imagining Naomi's face in this moment. Because this is sun up to sundown. Ruth has been in the field. And it just keeps getting better and better and better for Ruth. But Naomi doesn't have a clue what's going on. 
I don't know what Naomi did during the day. She might have talked to some of the neighbors. Uh, she might have gone out and gotten water, but likely she spent most of her time at her home in a depression because she was walking through tragedy. She was in the midst of despair. And she didn't have a lot of hope for what that moment was going to look like. Maybe Ruth will come back with a handful of grain. Maybe we'll be able to provide some bread for us. But I don't know what day two, day three, day four is going to bring. And here, Ruth comes back with what's likely enough food to feed the average field worker for two or three weeks. Slung over her shoulder, and she's like, and I got leftovers. Like, woo. Can you imagine Naomi's face in that moment? It's like, what is going on? What is happening? Suddenly, suddenly, something's, something's present here. And so her mother, but, but there's still a question that's hanging out there too, because Ruth still doesn't know who Boaz is. There's still this like eligible bachelor thing going on. And we, the reader, know that Naomi is going to know that connection. So how's that going to play out? Um, her mother-in-law said to her, where did you glean today? Great question, great question. Where have you worked? Blessed is the man who took notice of you. Like suddenly she's excited. She's got a smile on her face. So Ruth told her mother-in-law with whom she had worked and said, the man's name with whom I work today is Boaz. And you can imagine Naomi's like face snapping up and being like, who? <laughs> Boaz. And Naomi said to her daughter-in-law, may he be blessed by the Lord whose kindness has not forsaken the living or the dead. She's just, she's worshiping in this moment. And then she does a mother-in-law thing. Naomi also said to her, the man is a close relative of ours, one of our redeemers. That means it's Boaz's responsibility to marry Ruth. It's like Naomi can't not. And we're gonna get into that next week in, in the Old Testament, like the, the law reasons for that. But Naomi's like, hey, hey, hey. <laughs> like, I see the connections here. Let's go. But I love this because even as Naomi places this opportunity before Ruth, Ruth chooses faithfulness. Look at how she responds. Ruth says, Ruth the Moabite said, Besides, he said to me, you shall keep close to my young men until they have finished all the harvest. And Naomi said to Ruth, her daughter-in-law, it is good, my daughter, that you go out with these young women, lest in the field, another field, you be assaulted. Like, it's not safe. This is the time of the judges. This is not a safe place to be. So Ruth kept close to the young women of Boaz, gleaning until the end of the barley and wheat harvest. That's six or seven weeks. And she lived with her mother-in-law. I love Ruth's commitment to Naomi. Because even as, as Naomi says, there's an opportunity now for you, to, for you to go out, for you to maybe seek provision for yourself and satisfaction. Ruth says, no, my commitment, I made a commitment. That commitment I made was to you, Naomi. I will be with you. And she continues to go out into the fields and glean and take care of her family. Ruth continues to show her faithfulness. So Ruth 2 uh, it's kind of this meet cute moment between these two characters, Boaz and, and Ruth. Um, and we, they're both incredible characters. And there's some really profound applications for us as we think through uh, this chapter. And the first, the first that I just want to sit in, I want to wrestle with, I want to allow our hearts to really steep in is, is this. So I think profoundly Ruth too teaches us that righteousness matters. Righteousness matters in so many ways. This chapter starts by introducing us to this guy named Boaz, who's described as this mighty and him worthy man. Uh, he's rich, he's eligible, he's a hard worker. But above all of that, he's righteous. So righteous, uh, it's a church word. It means right standing before God, living in accordance with the ways that God desires people live. We believe beyond a shadow of a doubt that God created and ordered and structured the world. He embedded purpose and intentionality. He did not create accidentally. And because of that, we believe that God has decreed the right way, a right way to live. It's a way to live in accordance with who God is. It's righteousness. And righteousness doesn't always make sense. That was the first lie that was ever told. That was, that was Genesis 3, Satan 
tempting Eve, saying, did God really say not to eat the fruit? Like, it doesn't make sense that if this fruit is going to make you like God, that you wouldn't eat it. Righteousness, being like God, following God in this instance, wouldn't make sense, would it? Righteousness doesn't always make sense. And yet, righteousness matters. I think it's incredibly profound that in this passage, this rich man, this eligible, probably handsome, like every single felt board picture of Boaz that I've ever seen in Sunday school has depicted him as a very handsome man. (laughs) He's choosing to be righteous. This gleaning process, this cost him money. This was not effective. And there would have been years that would have gone by where there weren't widows gleaning in the fields. And yet when Ruth shows up and asks the the foreman of the field, can I glean? There's no doubt in her mind, there's no doubt in that foreman's mind that Boaz would allow this because Boaz has chosen to be righteous. And it's crazy because it's just two small verses, one tucked into Leviticus, one tucked into Deuteronomy. Easy to miss, easy to forget, especially considering that Boaz didn't have a copy of the law to read. He would have heard it read at regular gatherings, but that's his foundation. He would have been like in the back of his mind, I need to let people glean because God said so, and he did, even though it didn't make sense. And here's the crazy thing. We're going to see throughout the book of Ruth that God uses Boaz and Ruth to literally set the trajectory for his people, Israel, for the rest of the Old Testament. This is a monumentally pivotal moment for the history of Israel, and it's brought about because Boaz chose to do something righteous that didn't make sense. Church, Christians, Christ followers, Righteousness matters. There are moments and points and places in your life where culture is going to say, you don't need to choose to be righteous in that. It doesn't make sense. Why would that make sense? Righteousness matters. We don't need to understand it in order to do it. Little things Big things. I was confronted with this reality when I started uh, as a server at uh, what was one of Stevens Point's most illustrious restaurants, the four-star Michelin place called Golden Corral. Remember that? (laughs) That was great. I was a server. Uh, My job was to uh, clear off the plates and to refill the sodas because if people were filling up on soda, they weren't filling up on the endless shrimp buffet. And soda was a lot cheaper. So that's how, that's how our job worked. Um, and I, I got paid with tips. And so I don't know if you knew this. Uh, you're supposed to tip at Golden Corral because that's how I got paid. Um, and I was told like week one by one of the other servers, at the end of your shift, you go to report your tips. Do a calculation because we got paid server wages. You have to get paid over minimum wage. And he said, do a calculation. How many hours? What's minimum wage? Report the tips you need to make minimum wage, not anymore because you don't get taxed on what else more. And the government has plenty of money, right? We're not running a deficit or anything like that. They're running, they're they're great. Um, You just, just report the tips you made above. And that was a choice that I had to make. That was a moment I was confronted with. Righteousness matters. What are we going to do in that circumstance? This world, this culture has moment after moment where it's going to challenge those of us who call Jesus our Lord. It's going to challenge us. Don't let him be Lord of this area. Whether that's the media that we consume, the shows that we watch, the social media that we engage in, the movies, the books, the music, whether that's what we do with our bodies and our sexuality, There's going to become a point, if if you're dating, if you're engaged, where you're going to ask the question, why would I wait till marriage? Righteousness matters. Righteousness means something. And as God's people, we need to choose to trust in that. And so I, I would just say really, really clearly, if, if you're wrestling through this, you're processing through this this week, and you're like, okay, there are areas in my life where I have maybe not taking the strongest stance in righteousness. You gotta talk, we got to talk to someone. This is what small groups exist for. This is why we have communities. 
This is why we have church leaders reach out to an elder, reach out to someone on staff, talk and process. But we also have programs and classes around here that can support you in what you're wrestling with. We've got an incredible group that meets every single week called Men's Compass Group for men who are struggling with sexual addiction or pornography or just addiction in general. You can find more information on our our website, but get connected there. This fall, we're going to have a a lecture on a Monday night called Let's Talk About Sexual Brokenness. Or there's someone you know in your orbit or yourself or anything like that. You can come learn more about the programs that we'll be offering this fall for people. If you're struggling in your marriage, if you're struggling with addiction, if if you're struggling in what you're, you're engaged with, who you're engaged with, how you're handling alcohol, let's talk about it as a church. Let's take a stand on this foundation that righteousness matters. Boaz is an incredible example of that. But just as profoundly in this chapter, we have Ruth and Ruth's faithfulness. And we're reminded that faithfulness matters as well. Faithfulness is a stickiness. It's this relentlessness in pursuing a a good thing. And Ruth relentlessly pursues Naomi and being faithful to her mother-in-law. She's absolutely incredible. And faithfulness is important because it's God's posture towards us. He is faithful. We can be reminded as God is faithful that we're called to be faithful as well to to our family, to our church, to those around us. And then I love this because we can take these two things, this righteousness, how God has ordered the world and faithfulness, and we put them together. and, And I think in Ruth 2, we have this profound point. It's that God's provision often comes through God's people. As I was writing that, I wasn't sure about the word often. I think, I think it's probably more like usually. It's not always. God miraculously provides at some times. But usually God's provision comes through God's people who are choosing to be faithful, who are choosing to be righteous, who are seeing needs and addressing those needs, who are being the hands and feet of Jesus' church. When God moves in this community, he is going to move in this community because we choose to be righteous and faithful as a result to who he is, or as a response to who he is. And so choose to meet needs. I think about this profoundly um, when, uh, well, I mean, just check out the text. The text in and of itself um, is is crazy how this is uh, laid out because twice in this passage, it talks about God meeting Ruth and Naomi's needs. What were Ruth and Naomi's needs? Food. They needed food. And in verse 11 and 12, Boaz answered Ruth, and he said, the Lord is going to repay you for what you've done. The Lord is going to meet your needs. And in verse 20, Naomi recounts, she reflects on what's happened. She says, the Lord in his kindness has not forsaken us. Like both Boaz and Naomi are like, God is taking care of our needs. And yet in this chapter, just from the movers and the shakers, what is God doing? God is moving through his people. When we get to Ruth 4, we're going to see the second of two times, it's Ruth 1 and Ruth 4, where God directly intervenes in the book of Ruth. Ruth 2 doesn't have one of those moments. The food didn't miraculously appear. Boaz provided it. Ruth went and got it. Ruth was faithful. Boaz was righteous. God's provision comes through God's people. And so church, when you see a meal train listed on the Woodlands Virtual Community on Facebook, or an email goes out about it, It's easy to say, what's a meal? Like, what's providing a meal? That's a a small thing. But there's no way for you not to know that you showing up on a Thursday afternoon with a dinner that you cooked isn't answering a prayer that that family might be praying in that moment, God, remind us that someone cares. Or remind us that you're present in the midst of what we're walking through. Or if you sign up to serve in a youth group, small group, and you're working with eighth grade boys and they're squirrely and you're just like, what am I doing? Why did I sign up for this? And that's like 20 minutes into your first night. Um, What's to say that you're not the answer to some mother's prayer that she's been praying for years? God, would you provide a mentor for my son? Would you provide someone for him to look up to? When you serve church, God answers prayers through your faithfulness. So serve. Be the 
hands and feet of Jesus. And this isn't a challenge. This isn't a, a condemnation. This isn't a you have to do more. This is an invitation to keep your eyes open to how God might use your gifts and talents in his church. Because he wants to use you to meet the real needs of his people. God's provision comes through God's people. And all of that comes to a head at the end of this chapter where we see a distinctly different Naomi than we did last week. I love this because it's like, maybe it's 24 hours, right? Naomi and Ruth walk into Bethlehem. They settle. Naomi's like bitter. The Lord has dealt bitterly with me. Everything's terrible because she's walking through a really, really difficult time. And the next day, Ruth comes home with this grain and her entire, Naomi's entire countenance changes. It's because of God's faithfulness. It's because of God meeting real needs. And and it's this truth, remembering that God is faithful produces hope. Remembering that God is active, that God is working, that God is engaged in and through his church produces hope. Church, I'll tell you, later tonight, we get an opportunity to gather at Buchholz and to witness 29 different men and women and students getting baptized, sharing their story. What has God done in their lives? Choose to follow him. Show up to that because that will produce hope. If you feel hard about this world, if you feel weighty about the brokenness of life, Go to where God is moving and look and see and be present. Naomi wasn't alone. She had Ruth, who's been faithful. She has the community of God as it's designed, walking with her. She has a clear vision of the faithfulness of God and seeing that, remembering that, clinging to that, holding to the fact that God is faithful leaves her with hope. So church, we could be encouraged. Righteousness matters. Faithfulness matters. Service matters. And remembering who our God is will produce hope. Let's pray, let's worship, and then let's continue to live faithfully for him. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your word. Thank you so much for the powerful testimony of Boaz and Ruth and Naomi here in this text. Thank you for the ways that you provided, for the ways that you moved, for uh, the opportunities you gave for Boaz to be righteous. God, I pray that you would encourage our hearts. I pray that you would set our hearts firmly on the foundation of what your son Jesus has done for us, that in his death and his resurrection, he has conquered sin and death. He has purchased us as your sons and daughters given us a new identity. God, let us live in that identity of righteous, faithful, redeemed, purpose-filled people of God. God, I pray that you would encourage our hearts. We pray all this in Christ's name. Amen. You want to stand? Let's continue in worship.
came the morning that sealed the promise your buried body began to breathe and out of the silence the roaring lion declared the grave has no claim on me
shadow you won't light up Mountain you won't climb up Coming after me There's no wall you won't kick down Lie you won't tear down Coming after me There's no shadow you won't light up Mountain you won't climb up Coming after me There's no wall you won't kick down Lie you won't tear down Coming after me Please be seated. Hi, my name is Cooper. Hi, I'm Todd. Hi, my name is Natalie. Hi, my name is Shiloh. And, and I'm, I'm here, here today, today to get, get baptized. Good morning, Woodlands Church. It's good to be here with you this morning. My name is Justin Armstrong. I'm the youth pastor, so I work with 7th through 12th graders. I'll talk a little bit more about that and what we've been doing in a little bit. But if you're new here, I want to talk to you just for a minute and say that I'm so glad that you're here. Um, it's fun listening to the sermon and the story today and thinking about how people who are righteous and faithful um, are providing for um, other people. And I think how many of us in this room would raise our hand if asked the question, are you here at Woodlands Church because somebody else here was righteous and faithful? I know my hand would go up. I know the person who brought me, their hand would go up. And so it's cool to be in a community of people that are all brought here by others who've been righteous and faithful. So um, yeah, well done, church. Uh, just Proud to be here and thankful for all of you. Um, if you have gotten an email about a leadership gathering and you're a leader of leaders in this church, so you're involved in a ministry, you're leading other people, um, respond to RSVP to that email would be really helpful. Your deadline is tomorrow. So as John said a while ago, if you were putting it off to the last minute, the last minute has arrived. So go find that email. We're excited to have a leadership gathering where we get a bunch of the leaders together in this church and look at the upcoming ministry year. It's gonna be a really good time. As I said, I work with 7th through 12th graders, and um, this summer we let you know we went on two mission trips, so I want to let you know a little bit about what happened and some stories from those trips. So uh, the 7th and 8th graders went to the Twin Cities with an organization called YouthWorks. Uh, if you've never been on a youth mission trip specifically in that style, um, it's a trip really oriented around serving, and so it's kind of a first step into missions for junior high students. So we go to a different community, um, and oftentimes they send us out into that community to serve, to share who Jesus is by helping other people. The group I was with, um, we were able to go to a men's homelessness shelter. And maybe, I know Stevens Point's a little bit different than a big city like the Twin Cities, but maybe if you've been over like in Crossroad Commons now in the summer or somewhere else in town, and you pull up and there's somebody there with like a cardboard sign um, sitting there and you kind of do that awkward thing where you're like, oh, I hope I don't end up like stopped right next to them. And you try not to make eye contact. And it's like this really uncomfortable moment, which makes sense. It can be uncomfortable for people. Um, one of the things we learned is like that moment is painful to them over and over and over again. Because over time, what they begin to believe and what they experience is that they don't matter. That they're not looked at, that they're not seen. I mean, that people would rather just look away. 
And so one of the cool things we got to do was as these men came in who were tired and hungry um, and really hopeless, is I got to watch these middle school girls laugh and play and provide food and look them in the eye and just treat them like humans. And so it was incredible to see. And one of the other things that happened on that trip was a lot of the students, and myself included, were having some revelations about how when you go on a mission trip and when you go do these things, it's really fun to serve. If you've ever been on one, you know that, right? Like you have a lot of joy in serving. And then when you go home, you realize that serving's not so fun at home, right? Like nobody thinks about the dishes from dinner and goes, oh, this is going to be so great. Like this is just as worth it as the serving that I do on a mission trip. And so we were reflecting a lot on how do you take that same frame of mind that you are serving um, the people of God while you do that in your own home to your family. So it's incredible to see um, junior hires working through that. And for ninth and 10th graders, we went to Denver to a place called Lead the Cause. And it was a cool mix between a mission trip and a conference. And what their aim is, is to equip um, high school students or just students in general to reach other students. So if you don't know this, if you've never thought about it, um, if you've graduated high school, you might have realized, especially if you're out of college, that you kind of don't really meet new people anymore. Um, if you ever heard the joke that Jesus' greatest miracle is having 12 close friends when he was past his 30s? Have you ever heard that? Um, yeah, you just like, you graduate college and you're kind of like, cool, I will never meet a new person again, except for a couple times at my job. Uh, but high schoolers specifically are around all these new people all the time, right? Every semester, they get a brand new group of like 100 some people that they're around. It's incredible. And so what they do is they say, well, look at all these students who are around all of these people. Let's equip them to go be missionaries. So we got to go to Denver and you might remember we had all of the mission trip teams up here on stage and we commissioned them to go on to missions. What was really cool was when we got to Denver, we went through this week where students were trained, equipped, practiced, going to other people and asking them questions, getting to know them and to talk about Jesus. And at the end of the week, these 19 students were commissioned as missionaries back here. So we in Stevens Point area have 19 commissioned missionaries that are teenagers ready for this year. And I think that's incredible and exciting thing to look forward to this year. Yeah, they're, they're incredible students. They're really cool. It was, um, an honor to spend the time with them. So we're, we're looking forward to this year. Um, if you're a student, a parent, or grandparent of a student, we have a lot of stuff coming up. Um, the school year is going to kick off September 18th with our kickoff. We have the Rochelt Fair uh, fundraiser coming up. So if you're involved in youth ministries or you are youth, sign up for that. Um, basically, what you get to do is go to the Rochelt Fair for free. Get to eat so many cheese curds that you don't want to eat cheese curds anymore, which that is a pretty, yeah, it's a pretty high amount of cheese curds. Um, and you get to earn money towards trips and things. So if you're, um, yeah, if you're a youth, if you're a leader, you want to do that, sign up on our webpage. Um, and lastly, as we think about what Dave was talking about in the sermon, um, that video that played before I got up here, tonight we have a baptism service. And if you were here when we did a baptism service on Sunday, you know um, what Dave said, watching baptisms is this hope-filled moment. I think about that moment in the story where Ruth comes back and she gets to share the ways that God had been working in her life in that day with Naomi. And then Naomi's life changes because of what happened. And in a lot of ways, that's what going to a baptism service is, is you get to go and you get to watch what God is doing in the lives of other people. So instead of turning on Netflix or Amazon and watching the same thing you watch every single night or trying to figure out what to watch tonight, why don't you come out and listen to some stories of 29 people who are making a commitment to follow Jesus and celebrating that commitment tonight. So it should be a great time. And I'm going to leave you this morning um, with a passage from Romans. Um, Paul, writing to the Romans, he says, May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Go in the hope of Christ today, and I hope to see you tonight at the baptism service.